Hello and welcome everyone to the Logistic Regression Notebook. In this notebook we're going to have a look at how to implement a classifier. In fact we're going to use logistic regression as our model. And don't get fooled by the name here. Logistic regression does actually use a sigma transformation of a linear regression, hence the name, but it is for sure a classification model. If you're interested in a bit of background on how to get from the linear regression to a logistic regression, you can have a look at the introduction here. We're going to jump right in and we're going to load the data. The machine learning problem, as a reminder, is going to be to predict whether or not an individual is earning more than 50,000 US dollars. And we're going to use data from the US Census Bureau to answer that question. And we're going to load that data using the Fork Tables API. When we look at the libraries that we're importing for this problem, we're actually seeing a longer list now. We're going to use Scalern for some of the machine learning tasks, Fork Tables for importing our data. And we also have the standard libraries of Pandas and NumPy for reshaping and exploring our data. We also have Seaborn and Matplotlib to help us with the exploratory data analysis and to plot some of our results. Eventually, we're going to calculate the difference in accuracy and also the DPPL value. We're going to start by reading in the data set and defining the attributes that we actually want to consider. We're casting it as a data frame and then we're going to restrict the data frame to two groups, group number one and group number eight. Starting with the exploratory data analysis, we can have a look at the data frame, the first five rows with data frame.head. We can look at the shape, the total number of rows and columns. We can look at the different data types that we have. And then my suggestion is usually to take the features, the list of features that you have and split them between categorical and numerical values. Because eventually you will have to prepare your data according to the different data types. So it makes sense to split them out so you can treat them accordingly. One quick check that we want to do also is we want to make sure that the model target did not accidentally end up in the feature set. So here we just quickly check if the model target is in the list of features. Luckily for us, it's not, so we can proceed and have a look at the missing values next. We'll see that there's only one column with missing values. And we can also plot some of the other features that we have. Before plotting, my next suggestion is going to be to create a shortlist. Shortlist is going to be those features that you actually do want to plot because you might not want to have all of the different instances, especially if there is a categorical feature with 100 different sub-values, then you might not want to plot all of those in one graphic. So here we're restricting the plot to those attributes where we have less than 10 unique instances. One important plot is also going to be the target distribution. And then we'll have a look at the feature distribution. So this is now leveraging the shortlist. And as you can see here, we are only plotting those features that we have in our data set, those attributes, where we have less than 10 distinct instances or classes, we should call them. Finally, we need to decide which features we actually want to use for our machine learning model. We can drop the GCL feature that's not going to be relevant. In fact, we had a look at this in the exploratory data analysis stage as well, and the correlation plots could give us an indication on whether or not a particular feature is going to be relevant. Next, we're going to implement the train test validation split here. And you can see that we're choosing a test size of 0.1. So 10% of the data will be set aside for testing. And then we're going to take the train data and split that into train and validation. And here we're setting aside 15% for validation. And the remainder is going to be our training data set. So how can we actually prepare the data now? So we still have all of these numerical features. We know that we need to scale them. We have categorical features that we need to split into different columns. If you remember from the previous notebook on data processing, we need to take all of these categorical features and one hot encode them. 
And if we want to do this in a systematic manner, well then the suggestion would be to use pipeline and column transformer from sklearn. So how does this work? Step number one is going to be to set up a preparation step for each type of data. And then we're going to combine those into a model and eventually run the full pipeline. So step number one is we set up all the different operations that we want to perform on both the numerical and then we repeat again for the categorical data. And you can see here that for the numerical data, we impute the missing values with the mean value. And then we add a min-max scalar to scale our numerical features. In the case of categorical data, we're actually going to impute all the missing values with a category by itself. And we're going to fill everything in as a constant missing value. And then once we have those filled in, then we can use the one hot encoder. Then we need to combine those two steps into the column transformer. And once we have the column transformer, we add the model at the end, which in our case is going to be the logistic regression. Once the pipeline's ready, we can start passing data through the pipeline. So we take our training data set and call pipeline.fit and we provide the features and the labels. And then we repeat the same for the validation set. We can also start looking at the overall performance and the accuracy. We get an overall performance of 0.78. Remember again here, the closer to one, the better. At this point now, if we wanted to find the optimal settings of the logistic regression, we could try different combinations. We could tune our hyperparameters and we could go in the iterative loop. However, for us, it's just about building a full pipeline. So we're going to continue straight away to testing the classifier on the test set. Because we didn't actually tune the model, we would expect the performance to be very similar between validation and test. And we can also see that reflected here. The overall goal was to actually calculate the accuracy difference in the two groups and the DPPL value. So that's what we're going to do next. So DPPL, we're going to use the equation here. In fact, this is a custom function that I created myself. And you can see here, it's simply the ratios in the positive outcomes to the total members in the group and then the difference between the two. And here we can see that the DPPL value, because we're actually using the predicted labels here as an input, is going to be 0.38. And we can also compare the predicted outcomes now to the true outcomes because we have the ground truth. And you can see here that if I calculate the DPL value for the true labels, the greater 50K mark, the DPL is actually lower. So what happened? Our model was not specifically trained in a special way. We did not take any bias mitigation steps. So that actually made the outcomes worse. In terms of the accuracy, we can also have a look at that. The accuracy difference actually does not look too bad. We can do a deeper dive and have a look at the confusion matrix as well and see how the results fall. And what we would notice is that the number of individuals in the different groups are significantly different. So the members in group one, we have many more of those than we have in group eight. So we would need to investigate this further. For now, we're going to wrap up the notebook though with a distribution plot here to show what the true outcomes were and what the predictions created. And keep in mind now that the underlying ground truth is not necessarily a representation of how the world should be. So if there's already inherent bias in the labels themselves, well then even if the model reproduces a uh, very good performance on that training data, it's not necessarily the change that we want to see. So we need to investigate further if this is actually a desired outcome and then introduce bias mitigation techniques.